Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, May 12th, and we will hear the presentation, Let's Level Up Our Community Engagement Game. For technical help during today's webcast, uh, you can type your questions in the Q&A box, and I'll do my best to try to help you. Uh, for your content questions, again, just type them in that Q&A box. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2023. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored uh, by a whole bunch of, of our uh, great sponsors, the Urban Design and Preservation Division, Women in Planning Division, and the Ohio Chapter of APA. So thanks to all for joining. Upcoming webcasts. Man, we are booking out through August right now. Uh, so definitely tune in for our uh, summer series. These are our next two upcoming sessions. And we have more down coming down the pipeline. You can register for these in all of our upcoming sessions at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits. You can log your credits by heading over to planning.org, log into your My APA account. From there, you can search by today's title or event number, both of which, again, can be found on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where I post any important date or time changes. I post when new sessions are available for you to register for. And uh, I post a weekly reminder of what session is on tap for Friday. Lastly, we record all of our sessions and we post them onto our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and you'll be notified when new sessions are available for you to register for. If you head over to YouTube and type in planning webcast series, will pop up along with our well over 400 session recordings that are available all for free. So again, um, if you have any questions, type them into that Q&A box. We'll, we'll get to those at the end uh, during the Q&A. And you know what? Um, before we launch into things, I am going to launch those first two questions. Um, our YEP team, uh, they're the last portion of our presentation, have a few polling questions, but I just, I want to know them now. And I think everyone else does. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, launch two quick polls. Uh, the first one is, do you have any experience working with youth in planning? So go ahead and type in your answers, not type in, select your select your answers. Um, I don't think my panelists, you don't get to vote. So if you don't see it, that's why. And I'll give it another moment here. Well, we got a lot of people voting today. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and end it and then I'll share the results with everyone. So honestly, I'm surprised. 49% um, have some experience. Uh, two of you on here are experts, love it, and uh, another half of us uh, don't have experience. So good, you'll um, get to learn a little bit more later in the presentation. One more question for you. I'm launching it now. When did you first hear about planning? Elementary, high school, college, grad school, post school, or listen, I know a planner already, so I've known about it forever. Go ahead and give everyone a moment. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close it. Share the results. I don't know what I was thinking I was going to see. Um, and <laughs> Corinne and Lauren, I don't know if this is pretty normal for, for what you see when, when you have these polling questions, but 56% say, oh, I learned about it in college, uh, followed by 21% in high school. That's actually surprising to me. That is surprising to me, I feel like. 9% grad school, uh, post-school, 11%. Um, have some planners in the family, so we know about them. And then 2% uh, uh, also learned it in uh, elementary school. So that's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if that's interesting to you, but it is to me, at least. Um, that's I don't know. It's 
it's kind of exciting to hear that 21% of us learned about this in high school. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm done chattering. We've done our polls. I'm going to now turn it over to Della Rucker, who's going to kick things off for us. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Mm -hmm. If I can. There we go. Okay. All right, Della. Hi. Am I allowed now? Yep. You're good. The uh, the thingy bobber went away. And there's the thingy bobber. So good. okay, cool. Perfect. So yeah. So thanks everybody. I'm glad to get a chance to be with you today. Um we're gonna talk for a moment. Um just a real, real high level of framing. And anytime I do one of these kind of things, I, I risk doing a little bit of Captain Obvious, but sometimes I think it's really helpful when we're going to get into some really incredible work that our, our, my, my colleagues on this panel are going to be sharing with you just to, to take a step back and go, okay, what's the fundamental structures that we're dealing with and kind of what's the basis? So some of you, I, I, I'm older than dirt. Um, so some of you have known me. Uh, my name is Della Rucker. I am the principal of a firm called the Wise Economy Workshop. Uh, we mostly focus on what do the future, what does the future of communities and businesses and organizations look like? And how do we help those communities, organizations, and businesses move effectively into a future that's going to look very different from our past? And so a lot of my writing, my videos, my content, my books, all the stuff that I've been putting out over all these many years has been focused on those kinds of fundamental questions of taking our assumptions about how we do things and unpacking them and sort of taking them apart, looking at the machinery and saying, okay, what is there within this machinery that isn't serving us at this point in time and doesn't appear likely to serve us going forward into the future? So I had when when Christine gave me the opportunity to talk today, I went, okay, I'm gonna push a couple buttons, I fear, um, or maybe I'm glad to, I'm not quite sure which. I am a people pleaser despite all my talk. So, you know, it doesn't always feel that good. But I wanna talk about a very, very, very basic framework for thinking about truthful public engagement. And we're gonna start by addressing the question of why we so often hate public engagement. I've been involved in consulting for local governments, for regional agencies, for all sorts of organizations for nearly 20 years. And when you tell people that you're going to do a public engagement event, and by this I mean particularly the planners and the economic developers and the, and the other people who are going to be um, responsible for that work. We're going to hear some exceptional examples in a minute, but for the vast majority of us, it's not a good, you know, not, not a happy thing to hear. So what is it that makes public engagement so often miserable for us, as well as for very often the people who come and participate? Well, it's a frustrating experience. It's set up, um, our, our spaces are set up in a confrontational manner. Um, if it's a, a controversial issue, it's crowded and loud. If there are people who are going to be speaking, they have to go up to a podium. And this is usually a surprise to planners because we don't typically fit this, but Public speaking is the biggest fear that most people have in the world. It's a bigger fear for most of the population than flying, than things that can cause injury. 
People are scared to death of public speaking, and yet that's what they so often have to do in this context. And frankly, a lot of planners, even if they've gotten used to it, they don't like doing it either. Especially when we're dealing with things like development plans, it's confusing. And the confusion leads to frustration, and it's frustration on the part of of technical people who are trying to figure out how to explain these things to the public and frustration on the part of the public that's going, I don't get any of this. And I, because of this context that we're in, I don't know if I can trust you. Obviously, sometimes we just get crickets. We get silence. We get nobody showing up or we get this face. Everybody's seen this, right? where people, like I call it the TV face, because we all do that very easily when we're watching television or we're scrolling on our phones. It's kind of a flat face that we go to. And when you're a speaker and you're trying to speak to an audience, that gets that can be really, that's almost worse than not having anybody in the room because you've got no reaction whatsoever. And yet so often that is what we encounter. And then of course, go forward. There we go. Of course, sometimes we get this, right? They're coming after us with the uh, pitchforks and the, the, I think there's an ax in that mix somewhere that looks a little intimidating. So why? Why do we find ourselves so often in situations that are like that, that are frustrating, that are unnerving for everybody involved? that are um, intimidating and that don't feel like a good use of our time. So I'm gonna hit three sort of factors that I think play into why this becomes so much of a challenge for us. And there's a fourth factor that I haven't mentioned, which is that we've inherited structures that often sort of set up that dynamic. So if you look at a typical council chamber, it's intentionally designed to be an imposing space. And you've got your dais across the top, it's usually elevated and it's fancy, and those are obviously the important people. And then you've got, you know, the peons in, in the seats, You've got that microphone issue that I talked about before. And the whole thing is set up to, to be closer to resembling a courtroom than a collaborative environment. And Nate, nobody wants to be in a courtroom if they're not being paid to do it or if it's, you know, they don't have to be there. So that's one issue. Another issue is that no one has taught us how to do this. We know that we need to do these things, and I hope that there are planning programs now that are doing a better job of this, but I know that when I went through planning school and when I have worked with people who are younger than me who have come out of planning school, very typically they've learned all of this wonderful um, information. They've learned all of this wonderful um, means of building healthy and vibrant and resilient communities and managing them. But very often people haven't been, they haven't had the training in how to do that public engagement process in a manner that is truly productive and truly collaborative and truly beneficial to everybody involved. I happen to know um, the city of Cincinnati's work pretty well. And I can tell you that much of the incredible work that you're going to hear about from our friends in Cincinnati today came about because many of their staffers, many of their folks who were around in years past got beat up really badly in public meeting settings. And it wasn't until they had that experience and they started to try to figure out how to solve that problem that they developed a body of knowing how to do it. But for the vast majority of us, we end up learning that by hard docs. You know, we learn that because we've gotten beat up. And that's not necessarily a way to make people healthy and productive and, um, and open 
to that kind of public engagement. And for a lot of us, that causes us to close off. And it just makes it harder and harder to do public engagement that makes us and makes the people in the rooms feel like it was worth our while. A second issue is that, and again, we're gonna hear that Cincinnati has been breaking this mode as well. And the work that YEP has been doing, I think you'll, you'll really be amazed by this. Both of those two organizations have broken out of this model of only doing public engagement when there's a problem. Very typically, we have a development proposal. We have a, um, a, a zoning revision. We have some kind of event that poses a threat to somebody. And that's when we hold a public meeting. And it's no wonder that the people who come to that, they're already walking in scared and uncomfortable. We're already uncomfortable. You go into that, that room like I showed before, and yeah, we all feel like we're getting pushed into the corner. And finally, and this is the tough part, is that very often what we have promised in our public engagement isn't actually what we're gonna do. Now that's a um, that's a difficult statement. And when I started grappling with that myself, I was really uncomfortable, really, really uncomfortable because I had said all of the things that are on this screen here. Your opinion matters. Oh, we want this is your opportunity to shape this project. Your opinions will be included. Oh, we care what you think. And I might, my, for myself, believe that with all my heart. But I work within a structure, a context, an organization that doesn't necessarily share that. And because I'm the representative of that organization, what I really have found that I should have been saying are things like this. We're doing this because we have to, because the regulations say we have to have a meeting. Yes, we're gonna include your opinions, but they're gonna be in the back of the book and probably nobody's ever gonna read them. We don't really have the ability to care that much about what you think. Sorry about that. So don't get mad at me, don't shoot the messenger. A lot of it's not our fault. Some of it is. One thing that I tell planners and have been telling planners as I've been advising them for, for a couple of decades now is we can at least be truthful. So this is the framework that I think about when we do public engagement. Now, if you're really deep in public engagement, you might have encountered Arnstein's ladder of public engagement or the IAP, the Internet, the Institute, International Association of Public Practi Practice Participation. Don't say that. International Association of Public Participation Practitioners. They have a framework that they keep under lock and key and they only let their members um, use publicly. So that stuff's not very helpful. So years ago, I said, okay, there's four fundamental things that we could conceivably be doing with public, with public engagement. We could tell people things, we can ask them things, we can have a discussion with them, or we can engage them in the process of deciding. And my computer is really slow. There we go. Okay. So first, we could tell them, this is where the project is. This is why this development is happening. Here's the reasons for this proposal. In terms of the activities we do, and the next four slides, they're going to be all structured the same way. Telling people what's going on, we do this all the time, right? This is a huge amount of what we end up doing. We do information letter pages, we do newsletters, we do websites, we do slide presentations, we do fact sheets. That's telling people what's going on. And when we do that, 
what that public is hearing from us, if we're honest about it, they're going to understand three core things. They're going to understand that we want you to have full and accurate information. They might understand that this decision is, is pretty well made. And they might understand if we do this honestly and clearly that their ability to influence that decision at this point is not exhaustive, it might be very limited. And so again, it's a matter of being truthful and it's a matter of, of deciding which of these four categories you fall into, your work is falling into, the presentation, the meeting that you're having falls into. And just being as honest as possible about what the intent actually is. And I don't think, you know, that some political official who would like you to cover their tail might not like the fact that you want to tell them that the decision is mostly made. This is the final revision. You might be able to get a tweak, but, but it's pretty much in place. But I think you have a responsibility, not only to the public, but to yourselves, to be honest about that and to lay that out forthrightly. A lot of times we ask, we're asking them for their feedback. And I know the folks at YEP do this beautifully. And, and they're working with a population that requires them to do this in a very different way than what a lot of us who are long in the tooth have learned. And that's when we ask questions like, what do you wanna see here? What are you worried about? What do you think we should do? We do questionnaires, we do visual preference surveys. Sometimes we do that, you know, put your stickers on the map kind of activity. And those are wonderful ways to get very rich information from the public. But sometimes what we sort of leave unsaid is that by telling us that information, they may feel that what they're telling us is going to go into effect. And we all have had experiences where you can't do that, right? The political, you know, it's it's not within the political cards right now. It may not be conceive, it may not be physically or economically possible. It may be something that is not widely desired, um, does not represent a consensus, or does not uh, move the community forward in ways that are appropriate. But if we don't tell them that we're not, that we want to feed, that we want to understand what what they're looking for, we do want to know what you think. But we can't guarantee that what you say and what happens are going to be connected. And I think it's important for us to say, I am, the pers I am the person standing in front of you. I don't fully control the decision-making. This is what the decision-making process looks like. I can put this information in front of them. I cannot guarantee that it gets done, that it gets used, that it gets read. And that can be very uncomfortable because we wanna have the answers and we don't wanna tell people things that they don't wanna hear. But again, for their benefit and for ourselves, I think that's extremely important. There's a few, there's two more ways that we could be doing public engagement that are um, newer to us. One is to do a discussion. So we ask things like, you live in this community, can you help us identify some appropriate solutions? We might do a charrette, we might do kind of an intensive strategic plan, and when we do that, we're setting that up as a peer process. It's not me telling you things. It is me as a person with a particular area of expertise and responsibility collaborating with you who have other areas of expertise and, and responsibility. But it's also important to say, again, if we don't control the decision-making, we don't control the decision-making. And finally, in some very rare circumstances, we find that we can put the decision-making in the hands of the people of the community. 
And most of the time when that happens, that I have seen, it's been within the realm of what's called participatory budgeting. And if you're not familiar with participatory budgeting, that's worth looking into. Um, it's essentially a method for taking a discretionary piece of funding. Um, the city of Los Angeles does this, for example. They will have funding for particular districts and they will basically work with the community to develop the information and the knowledge to for the community to make the decisions about how that funding is going to be expended. And that's incredibly powerful. It tells the community that we trust that you're going to be able to make the best decisions. It tells them that the city, the community, the government is seeking transparency. There are some times where it it's, can be a way to get out of being responsible when somebody else doesn't like how the community decided to spend that pot of money. So here's my guide to doing truthful public engagement. State honestly and clearly to the public what kind of public engagement you are doing. We're here today to tell you about this project. We are here today to ask for your feedback, which we will then forward to the people who are the decision makers. Here is who the decision makers are. You can make clear where your power begins and your power ends. Those are matters, in my opinion, of integrity. Those are matters of being, I would say, ethically responsible to the communities that we have made a commitment to serve. And at the end of the day, your own integrity matters. It matters for you personally. It matters for your organization. It matters for your community. When you tell people the truth, they have cause to trust you. And we all know from watching politics locally, globally, nationally, how, e how fragile trust is, how difficult it is to build, and how easily it's broken. So maintain your own integrity. You have the right to do that. You have the, more, the ethical responsibility to do that. And I hope that that framework of tell, ask, discuss, decide gives you a little bit of some working tools for evaluating opportunities, and situations in which you need to do public engagement and deciding kind of that fundamental strategy of how you're going to do that. That's backwards. So a lot of times I end what I'm saying with uh, go get them. I write about this and a lot of other topics. Um, the easiest way to stay in touch with me is you can do a free subscription at wiseeconomy.com. And uh, I thank you very much for your time. Christine, all yours. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Della, as always. Um, we are going to now move. And again, if you have questions for Della, type them in. I see them coming in. Um, next up, we're going to introduce the city of Cincinnati. Um, and I, I love this group and what they're doing. And if you saw in the title, we're calling it Simcinnati. If you if you caught on to that in the title or in the description of this session. And I'm just going to leave that as the cliffhanger and uh, let um, a couple of our planning friends from the city of Cincinnati, we have Andrew and uh, Maria and Gabrielle joining us here to talk about uh, their community engagement efforts at the city of Cincinnati. See, there it is. All right. I'll leave it up to you guys. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today and um, coming to listen to this presentation. Um, my name is Gabrielle Couch, um, and I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, so all of us here are with the Department of City Planning and Engagement for the city of Cincinnati. Um, and we're going to talk about how our department has gamified public engagement. So we're really lucky to have a really great, creative and enthusiastic team working together on this project. Um, our team consists of myself as well as my colleagues, Maria Dinger um, and Andrew Halt. 
Um, so to outline our time together today, um, first I'm going to give an overview of the initiative that we're engaging on in the first place called Connected Communities. Um, then Maria is going to go over our engagement design and process. And then Andrew is going to go through our results, including the data and equity analysis. So all of these activities were created for our city's Connected Communities Initiative, which is a series of potential policy changes related to how land is developed. Um, and this is being spearheaded by our mayor and some specific city council members. Um, it's important to note here for all of you that these engagements took place prior to any policy writing. Um, and this process was meant to inform the proposal that would be to come later. Um, so the purpose of this initiative is to help Cincinnati become more people focused um, and to support new growth, investment and population in the city. So connected communities includes a broad range of topics. Um, so we've sorted them into six total focus areas, which you can see here. Um, and in our initial engagement, we prioritize the top three areas, which are middle housing, reduced regulatory barriers and parking. These are the areas that were um, expected to create the most change when implemented. So that's kind of why we focused on these and more integrated the bottom three in throughout this. So now I'll go ahead um, and kick it to Maria. Hi, yeah, so we engaged on those topics. Uh, we were tasked with creating a really interactive engagement. And as you guys know, um, zoning and land use can be quite complex. So we were trying to create really accessible um, educational activities and also build a dialogue and connection with and within communities. Uh, we wanted to understand where the line is and also prioritize and balance the stakeholder needs um, in order to generate those policy recommendations. Up oh, next slide. So the process that we used, uh, we, we actually um, worked with Bloomberg last year on community engagement for citywide processes, but we um, went through a process of ideation, iteration and testing. And you can see that we use sort of both in-person brainstorming activities or brainstorming, you know, just whiteboarding. And then we also did virtual whiteboards. Um, we did some stakeholder mapping in the beginning. Um, and also once we created some ideas, um, we went right into creating like rapid prototypes. So you can go to the next slide. So you can kind of see we had several iterations of each of the activities and that each of those boards are on the three main buckets. And then the last board is the um, the game that we used to, that we created to create like just a baseline of understanding really quickly. So you can go to the next slide. So here you can see we actually tested with um, sort of trusted stakeholders inside of the city. Um, we ran through the events and, in, in, you know, early on in the, the two months before the actual engagement events. Um, and we refined and tested and got to a point where we could actually engage in under an hour on the, on the game to get those concepts out. Um, we actually built in some presentations before each the game and each of the activities. Um, and then, um, yeah, we got all that in, in in two hours and we you can go to the next slide. So we, we decided to schedule, we actually ended up doing eight events total and we tried to kind of spread them out throughout the city. We also tracked where we engaged and who we engaged with um, so that we could kind of find some of the gaps. But um, all to say that that um, two hour event was the same event and we were able to hold it both both virtually and in person and um, people really seemed to like it which Andrew will kind of go through the actual activities themselves um, but yeah we found that um, people generally did understand what um, the planning concepts and kind of the the things that we have to wrestle with in planning and zoning and the trade-offs and whatnot um, and that ultimately informed sort of the input that they gave on the actual sort of policy engagement all right thanks Maria um, so our, as Marie was saying, we had a list of goals that we wanted to achieve in our engagement meetings, but one of our overall um, challenges was to make these meetings very active, um, like little Fiona the Hippo here, Cincinnati's favorite. Um, we didn't want to just be showing a PowerPoint and we wanted residents to feel um, that really time flies and you're having fun. So our first activity was to show um, that people live in a variety of housing types throughout their lives and not just um, the classic what people think like a single family home. So how this was structured is that we went around the table. Uh, we had tables about um, between six and eight people with a facilitator and a note taker. Um, and then everybody would just list out all the types of housing that they've lived throughout their lives, whether it was a shoebox when they were with uh, four other people in college or in a single family home, a multi-generational household, or um, something where they've downsized as they reach retirement. 
it's really amazing to hear all the diversity of housing situations. Um, and we think that really made people understand the need for um, housing diversity and just for um, different times of their lives and how that's important. So as Maria described earlier, we have three main activity boards that we use to engage our participants to get their feedback. There was one on metal housing, uh, one on reduced regulatory barriers, and one on parking. And since our time's limited today, um, we're not going to delve into these specifically, um, but we, at the end of the presentation, we will share the link um, to our website where all these boards, including the InDesign files, are located in case you want to uh, take a closer look. Um, but before we did each of these activity boards, we did a game that we called Simpsonati. And the idea of the game is to help your neighborhood grow. So participants are urban planners for the game, and we wanted them to create a neighborhood that they're happy with. However, they didn't need to accommodate new neighbors in their neighborhood. They couldn't just put the growth somewhere else. Uh, everyone at the table had to work together as a team to create some housing solutions. The goal of the game was to really have residents start to think like planners. And we wanted residents to learn and understand basic planning concepts without having to have a degree in planning. We only had two hours uh, for these engagement events, and even the briefest of planning 101 courses would be pretty boring and woefully inadequate to uh, get residents up to speed in that amount of time. So we really wanted to learn planning concepts without a degree. And then the second line of reasoning is a, a feeling that I know a lot of planners feel that really, if planning is so easy, why don't you do it? It's a lot easier to criticize and poke holes in something rather than to do it yourself. So we wanted residents to have skin in the game and to make these hard decisions themselves. So here's what the Cincinnati game board looks like in detail. And as you can see, there's a variety of housing typologies and uh, businesses on the board. And this is a single family home. And you can see uh, this um, little number up here. This is how many households are into each type of house. And so this is a duplex. This is a small scale mixed use apartment building. And this is a large apartment building. And both apartment buildings can have a uh, commercial on the ground floor. This green area is what we call the bonus zone. And this is essentially the area that is encompasses the neighborhood business district and then the areas around transit lines. Um, and this is the area where it's easier for people to walk bike and take transit where you don't need a car as much, even though, as you can see, we did add some parking lots uh, throughout the business district. And what this area provided was some additional incentives for people to um, certain bonuses when things were put into the green area. And so, you, for example, if you had a large apartment building, if it was built outside this bonus zone, you had to build a parking lot next to it because if everybody's driving, um, you need to make sure that they have parking for the apartment building. But if it's in the green bonus zone, then people can walk, bike, and take transit. The game is broken up into a tiered system, which is based on the idea of needing a critical mass of population to pay taxes and to use amenities. The first tier was 20 households, and we asked, we asked all tables to reach this level um, since we considered this just normal population growth. And then once a table reached 20 households, they got certain bonuses. They were able to put in street trees, a bike lane, and then a grocery store with parking. And the reason why they had to have a parking lot there um, was because the neighborhood wasn't uh, large enough to support a grocery store on their own. And so there needed to be a parking lot so people from outside of the neighborhood could get there. If they reached 50 households, they could add a brewery, which is very important here in Cincinnati. Uh, there's a restaurant. And then there's also uh, a bus line that they could add. And then if they added the bus line in, then they would expand that green bonus zone area. And then if you reached 100 households, you could add a park, an ice cream shop, and then a grocery store, and then this time without parking, because the, um, the uh, neighborhood would be big enough where they could support the grocery store on their own. However, you also must add a school and a parking garage if there's no bus line, and this is because uh, as more people, you need more services. So here are some images of the uh, Connected Communities events in action. As you can see, they were well attended and everyone, as you can see, is having a great time. Uh, there were eight events in total with 236 attendees from 40 out of uh, Cincinnati's 52 neighborhoods, and then over 1,200 survey responses from a survey that we sent out beforehand. So that gave us a lot of data to crunch. And here is an image of our illustrious team at uh, our virtual engagement event. Um, we actually had two virtual engagement events. And then um, for all these uh, virtual events, we were able to do all of our uh, same activities that we did in person. So we were able to get similar data for people who weren't able to uh, come to the meetings in person. Now we're going to go over some of the results from the activity boards that we had. 
first was middle housing. And then we found that Cincinnatians, Cincinnatians did have an openness to middle housing, especially in um, the areas around neighborhood business districts and transit corridors, there was a decent amount of support. So you can see here in the area of around a quarter mile around transit uh, and neighborhood business districts, over 66% of people um, were in support of allowing middle housing outright with another between 20 and 28% supportive, but maybe with some changes for things like um, having architectural um, historic designations. And only about 9% not wanting any um, middle housing at all. Support was pretty much the same, but a little bit lower for um, middle housing in a half mile around MBDs and transit corridors was a little bit lower for citywide, but as you can see, only about 27% of people didn't want any middle housing whatsoever. And then from an overall average, about 56% of people were supportive of middle housing, and then only about 12% of people were not supportive at all. Moving on to reduce regulatory barriers. There was cautious support for reducing regulatory barriers, but as you can see, there's a little bit more red on these graphs here. Uh, and so we looked at density, setback, and height, and the most support was actually for density, and especially in the um, near yeah. transit and neighborhood business districts yeah. and in multifamily zones. And then you can see the single family zones and citywide where uh, there was a little more pushback. And then you can see the same, um, but a little bit more in, uh, set, for setback and height as well. But transit and neighborhood business districts, there was still more support than, uh, than less. Finally, everyone's favorite topic, parking. There was support overall for reducing parking minimums. You weren't able to uh, show the board in detail today. But one of the activities we had for the parking board was to have residents guess how much of a, what the division of land was in the neighborhood business district. Um, and so we, they had, we had them guess how much land was devoted to parking, roads and sidewalks, buildings, and other. And what we found was that people overestimated the amount of buildings by about 20% underestimated me out parking by about 20%. And then we're actually pretty spot on for roads and sidewalks, which we found pretty interesting. In, ter in terms of parking minimum opinions, uh, there was about 40% of people who pretty much wanted to eliminate parking minimums generally, uh, about 22% who wanted to relax, and then about 30% who wanted to have no change parking minimums. We also looked at parking minimums by use. And as you would expect, parking in residential areas was a little bit more contentious than parking at commercial or office areas, but excuse me, but there was still overall support or at least openness to relax parking minimums in the city. In addition, we did get some data from the game Cincinnati and we looked at where people would be place, placing houses on the board relative to other places. So you can see these heat maps here. And we found that in general, people when they had con similar constraints to planners, thought like planners they would put more housing in the bonus zone, the area near um, places where you can walk, take transit and bike where, and they also generally wanted to preserve some of the single family more on the outskirts of their little neighborhoods here. So I'm gonna turn it over to Abby to uh, finish this out. Um, thank you, Andrew. So um, after all of these events, we did send out um, an exit survey to participants and we actually got pretty positive feedback. Um, so as you can see here, um, at, when asking people how, how satisfied they were with the event overall, 70% uh, of respondents gave the overall event a score of four or five, which um, we feel pretty pleased about, and that feels pretty successful to us. Um, we also asked some specific questions. So um, we asked people how valuable they found the game Cincinnati. Um, and it seemed that people generally felt very positively about this as well. Um, really only eight people said that they found no value in it whatsoever, which is, you know, pretty good number considering the other responses. <laughs> um, so moving on, um, we also wanted to look at the equity of these events. Um, so we collected demographic data for each event that we held. Um, and we found that on average, our attendees were older, more educated, whiter, and homeowning than the general population in the city. So to try to combat this, we created an equity outreach priority analysis index, um, where we looked at the population, income, number of renters, 
Black population and education levels for every neighborhood in the city, according to the 2020 census data. And we compared this to the neighborhoods where we were seeing signups for our events to create a total priority score. Um, this generated for us a ranked list of neighborhoods where we could target our outreach and promotion of these events. And we found that to be very helpful throughout this process. Um, so now, just in terms of next steps um, to close us out, we're in the middle of synthesizing all of this data um, and putting it together with other things that we've done like research and um, professional stakeholder engagement with people like developers and architects in our city um, and trying to build a policy that makes sense based on all of the feedback that we've heard. Um, and we're also continuing to do outreach and engagement as appropriate. Um, so that's pretty much all that we had today. Um, you can find all of our materials and additional um, information on our website, which is here, as well as um, I believe Christine sent it in the chat as well. So thank you. I did. It's in the chat box. So folks, feel free to click on that and peruse around. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, coming up next, um, we have our YEP team to talk about youth engagement and planning. Um, remember, if you have questions, type them in the Q&A box. Don't raise your hand. Um, just get them typed in there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am not quite seeing my screen real quick. Um, can you guys see the pre presentation? So we see it in like um, edit like, mode. Okay, let me see if I can, let's see. Is that better? That's perfect, actually. Okay. Great. <laughs> Wonderful, hey. okay, Phew. good. I was worried for a second, okay. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you, um, Christine, for having us today. And um, thank you to the other presenters as well. This is really fun information to look at all the ways in which um, we engage our communities and um, kind of best practices and whatnot. Um, my name is Corinne Wendell. So I'm the founder and executive director of YEP, Youth Engagement Planning, also by day and the CD director for the City of Little Canada here in Minnesota. Uh, my colleague today is Lauren Trice. Um, she is our director of development for YEP and she's over in Virginia. Um, and actually all of our board of directors um, span coast to coast. So we have uh, quite the reach, which is really exciting um, for the work that we do. Um, so we're gonna share with you um, some of what we do, our background, best practices, um, the tools and resources that we've developed. Um, but we wanted to kick off with sort of like, how can this all come together? So for us, especially youth are very important to the community engagement experience. Um, so this, I just want to start off, kick off with a really good example, um, and then we'll get into kind of the nuts and bolts of what we do. But this was a project that we did um, in Little Canada, the city I work for. Um, this was actually done over COVID, so we had extra special um, <laughs> kind of uh, things to overcome, uh, challenges and whatnot. But we had a Pioneer Park master plan that had been done a few years ago, and it really didn't receive the community engagement that it deserved. Um, so we decided to go back to the starting ground of it and to to ensure that all uh, parts of the community were represented and especially youth. Youth were not represented in the beginning. And so this was something where we were able to um, create a survey. We were able to create explainer videos to send to the classrooms. We had over 600 youth participate from three different schools. And we we're able to have them participate in not only the written survey, a visual preference survey, and then we asked them to do an art project. And then we were able to synthesize the data that came in in a qualitative and a quantitative way. And so we we're able to have both types of um, results come in. And then we were able to share that with our council members um, and across the board with all of our city staff and the consultants that we were working with as well. Um, and so with that, we were also um, communicating over Zoom. We were able to Zoom right into the classroom and we're able to communicate with the teachers who were sort of our conduit for, for getting things done. And then they were able to upload all of their art projects, which could be done in any medium. So whatever they were comfortable in and upload it to um, a, a Google Drive that we could access. And through that process, we we're able to make recommendations that came straight from the youth. And so they're listed here on the screen, um, having accessible playgrounds, um, trying to rearrange how the, the multi-use fields were, were used at the time, incorporating a water activity, 
having a nature area, um, having an area where people could build relationships. Um, and so um, the students were really careful to ask, you know, meaningful and thoughtful questions. They wanted to make sure everyone was happy, like what makes a happy space. And from that experience, about 80% of what they said went into the actual plan. And we will be breaking ground here in the spring. So this was a very successful project that had a lot of what we use for a normal planning process, which was really exciting for us. So with that, I will kind of um, go back in time here and just talk about what we do as an organization. So YEP is a nonprofit organization focused on teaching kids K through 12 about urban planning and civic engagement. Um, so we began uh, back in 2007. So it's been about 17 years. Um, and then around 2016, 17, um, we officially made it a 501c3. We had so much activity, so much involvement from a lot of planners that we decided to um, kind of harness that energy and to um, make Making an official nonprofit, um, and then we were able to have more tools and resources accessible through our website and um, through doing uh, workshops and webinars and um, and our teaching. And so, um, it's really important for us to create mean meaningful opportunities for youth to engage um, in the community in the planning process. Uh, we teach planners how to go into the schools and teach kids about urban planning from that question early on. Uh, usually, uh, people don't know about planning until college or after they receive their first degree. Uh, like me, or were uh, recovering um, architects, <laughs> so received an architecture degree first, um, working in an architecture firm, and then went back to grad school for city and regional planning. And so that was uh, my journey, and I feel that is a lot of uh, similarities between me and other planners of when they first heard about planning. And so we really want to break the mold on that. We really want to introduce planning early on um, to youth um, so that they have the opportunity to come into the profession. We can grow our profession. We can incorporate um, greater diversity um, and gender uh, parity in our profession as well. And so we really want to educate young people. We want to go into communities that are underserved. Um, we really focus on that in a lot of the, the events that we do and workshops. Uh, we try to um, see areas that maybe haven't had a voice before, maybe need to elevate their voice. Um, we want to create leadership opportunities. Um, we want to teach kiddos, you know, what is it like to work in local government or a private sector or a nonprofit? What is it like to go to a city council meeting? Um, it's about removing those barriers that a lot of people think. Um, we had a kiddo one time ask, you know, do I have to make an appointment with the planner or do I have to pay to see the planner? Uh, so there's a lot of misconceptions about how you get information either from city hall or from, um, you know, local government that we really can um, talk about at an early age and kind of take away the, the mystery of, of what we do um, in our profession. And then also we, we do a lot of workshops nationwide, um, commonly at the National Planning Conference, um, state conferences. Um, we go in and teach planners how to engage with youth. Um, and we also have our award-winning Girls Who Plan program to specifically target um, girl-related uh, programs. Um, so we're working currently with the Girl Scouts um, and uh, we've also worked with the Boys and Girls Club and, and other groups um, to achieve that gender parity within our um, profession. Uh, we have an inventors in planning curriculum that you can find on our website. Um, it's a nine week program. We had teachers um, review all of our curriculum and criteria and give us feedback and they all also wanted us to go to the classroom more often. They said, this is great that you come once, but can you come over a series and teach throughout um, the semester? So we have um, committed to that and provided resources for that. And then everything that we have is free and downloadable on our website, which is amazing um, and accessible to all. And so why do we do this work? Um, well, youth represent a quarter of our population. They are ever so important to the decision-making that happens in our communities. They have a perspective and insight and they see things in a way that we don't see them. As kids, you have a different type of day-to-day, -day, um, kind of what you pick up and what you notice um, than we do as adults. And so they bring that to the table and we would otherwise not have that incorporated um, into the planning that we do. And so we really wanna give them the significant role that they deserve um, in how we um, ask for feedback. 
So some of our foundational principles, we'll go through them a little bit here. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that when you're looking into doing youth engagement, that you really think about it ahead of time. You kind of plan it out. What are we going to be doing? Who is the audience? What are we trying to accomplish at the end of the day? Um, and then depending on that age group, um, you then make sure that your content is age appropriate. If you're working with elementary school students, it'll be a little different than high school students. Um, even we work with young adults, 18 to 26. And so you really want to make sure ahead of time what is appropriate for that age. We suggest you go to the, you know, the bookstore, look up some maybe books for that age category and see what they're learning, what vocabulary they're using, um, and sort of get an idea. Um, or you can always call us. We are helpful to give a uh, custom curriculum all the time and uh, suggestions on activities and uh, what would be appropriate. Um, we always say the younger the audience, the more tactile you want the activities. We always want to have something that you are doing with your hands. You're building something, you're observing something, you're being active, you're moving around in the space. Um, we always want to make sure that youth are using all of their senses, that they can be really fully involved in, in, the, in the workshop or in the event that you're um, putting on for them to innate in order to get their feedback, which is um, the most important part. And then with the middle schoolers, they can be more goal oriented and maybe they can solve some problems. They start to get that um, additional, um, you can kind of make it a little more technical for them, but they also need clear and straightforward rules. Um, you just don't want a, a group of fifth graders, you know, running off into a park by themselves, you know, kind of noting things you want to have, you know, your, um, your planner with them. You want to make sure that they have clear um, instructions. Um, and then you want to make sure that they're using their creative thinking and that they are part of the process and that they are um, participating in ways um, that are is really fun for them too. And then of course with age appropriate and there's vocabulary. So with the, you know, the second graders that I taught a few weeks ago, we community garden, they know that, they know um, freeway, they may not know gentrification yet, uh, they may not know infrastructure, those are words that we use um, that we definitely want to simplify. So you wanna make sure that you're using the appropriate vocabulary or using visual aids, at least if you have a word that we use commonly, ecosystem, maybe you have a visual that goes with it um, so that it can, they kind of link together. Also in um, on our website, you can download this. This is one of our probably most downloaded items is our best practices um, and was done with the, um, the University of Minnesota students um, as one of their capstones that we um, partnered with. And so this is something that we really want to um, give to our planners as sort of that foundational work. Have you, if you've never worked with youth or if you're sort of in that middle range where we saw in our um, survey, some folks have done a little bit, but this is a great read through that you have all of the kind of nuts and bolts of what to expect. Um, we want to make sure that we're engaging young people early on. We don't want to include them at the end. We don't want to make them a token piece of the engagement. We really want to make sure that they know that they have a voice and that we want to initiate that early on. We want to have those shared objectives. What are we doing for this project? Why is it important that we're reaching out to you? Um, you want to sustain those partnerships. So if you have a, a relationship with a teacher or a school district, you may have those same students incorporated in many different processes along the way. You may go back to them later. Um, we always say um, that you want to come full circle. So once the process and the project are is done and it's implemented, you want to go back and, said, and say to them, this is what you had said and this is what happened. And you were a part of that. You were a part of that change. Um, similar to what we did at Pioneer Park. They're all going to be there for the ribbon cutting and they're all going to get to see in person what they all voted on. And it's going to be amazing. Um, we also want to make sure we make use of their expertise. So they, again, have this very unique perspective and they imagine things and see things that we don't see. And they really have a sense of adventure. And I think that they can really incorporate something that you've never thought of before. Um, of course, with diversity, we want to ensure that we have all of our, the parts of our community engaged um, in the process and that you want to make a point to do it, that it's prioritized and that you're reaching out to all the different areas um, that you can within your community to ensure that the process is, you know, very well participated in and that all the students have, you know, have a say and have an, um, an option to come and participate. 
Um, we also want to make sure that you are having meaningful inclusion um, and that you create opportunities where kids feel that they belong and that they um, should be a part of the process um, and pick those activities, especially for what you need for your project, but also that they would be really interested in being a part of. Um, you're really giving them sort of this skill building and this knowledge that they never had before. And so it's kind of a two way street. They're learning things they never learned before. And then you are also kind of gaining information that you've never had before. So it's really an awesome opportunity and, and those relationships that are made. Um, we want to make sure that, um, again, we come full circle with the youth and we report back to them um, and that you seek future youth engagement opportunities. So in Little Canada, we have um, youth commissioners on our Park and Rec um, Commission, as well as our Planning Commission. They're full voting members. They're both uh, two young women who are freshmen in high school. And we wanted to sustain that relationship and ensure that they had a say in not only that certain project, but citywide in the, the decisions that are being made. Um, of course, share your success stories. Um, this is something that's really great that you can um, prioritize and have even as a part of the plan, um, you know, the success stories that happened or even social media, having it on your website, um, really kind of um, making sure that they know that you value what, um, what opinions that they gave and the interactions that you've had. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that uh, we have, you know, culturally responsive activities. We want to make sure that we are um, providing an, uh, you know, a safe environment. We're providing um, opportunities that really apply to all youth um, and that everyone can um, have a piece and, a, you know, take part in what you're asking them to um, respond to. Um, and then, oh, actually, I'm going to switch it over to Lauren. She's going to talk to you a little bit Hi. about our um, curriculum. So welcome, Lauren. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk through some specific examples of resources on our website and then some different types of ways that you can do youth engagement in action. Uh, we do have a ton of free resources on our website, including everything from full curriculums to word searches that you can print out for your community. Um, one of the things we're most excited about is our Adventures in Planning program, which is new. It's a nine week program. And I think we have the next slide, Corinne, here in charge. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, a nine week Adventures in Planning program that we worked on in partnership with the Urban Design and Preservation Division and each week you learn a different type of planning. And then at the end, you put together a comprehensive plan. And it, um, it would be really exciting to take into a school. And it's written so that planners can bring it to a school. Uh, so it is a resource available to you. Uh, we also have our guide to youth engagement available. Uh, this is really great if you're feeling apprehensive about youth engagement, we find a lot of planners are just nervous and need to know how to start. Uh, this talks about just how to get set up that relationship and to really get involved in the schools. We also have, for those of you who are really excited about implementing it in the plan you're working on now and you're ready to move, you're ready to put together youth engagement, we have an action plan workbook. Um, that goes through each step to help you develop what you're working on and really make sure that it is effective and ask all the right questions. And as Karen said, we also are available to help work through this youth engagement action plan if you have any questions. Um, one of the first things you'll see is who are you planning on engaging and what are the what is their capacity for engagement at that point in time? You know, what are they learning? Uh, what are their um, abilities at that point. So we talked about the tactile activities versus wanting to be more empowered, um, depending on the age range. But we um, did use IAP2 or the International Association for Public Participation. Their um, consult, collaborate, inform, involve, empower. We also added teach as a part of what kind of engagement do you want to do? Um, there's a whole range, and this helps you to figure out the level of um, time it's going to take, but also what are you actually looking for youth to do? It helps to answer those kind of questions. 
This is an example of our planning day in school where we do have a planner who goes into a classroom and teaches about planning. It's a one day experience where kids can learn about what planners do. So this helps to really bring that age range down for when you learn about planning. And we have all different kinds of activities to help you with that if you're interested in um, just getting into a classroom for a one day experience. Uh, we also do activities at national conferences, usually where we uh, train planners to just instantly engage with you. So we spend some time training the planners and then put them in front of you to work on a project in that community. So this was at the national conference in New Orleans, where we worked with the Boys and Girls Club. There were stations set up. And planners actually did the stations and worked with the youth um, to take away that fear again, to get people out there and engaging with youth. And we also did the same thing in Philadelphia, uh, where we most recently, where we worked on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway to talk about ways to engage youth in that conversation that is a work in progress right now. They're working on reimagining the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. So we were able to get our planners to be involved in that process. So this is answering some of the questions I saw in the chat. Uh, how do we talk about planning at different age levels? What does that look like? This is a presentation I did in Louisville, Colorado. You'll notice my wedding photo there. Um, and that is because sometimes tackling the whole urban planning concept is too much. So I always start this conversation with second graders, which what is a plan? Have you ever had a plan? I'm having a plan to make, you know, to get married and have a wedding. And you'll get really great answers like I'm planning to have my friends sleep over or I'm planning to go to the moon. You know, they have they understand what an idea for the future is. So then when you put that together with, OK, and what are your ideas for our city? What do you think it'll be like in the future? I also love that. Here we brought out actual plans that they were working on. And look at these second graders being so engaged with what was going on in their community. This is a project with fourth graders. So here we started talking about adaptive reuse. My background is in historic preservation. And this allowed us to talk about a real building in their community um, that was for rent. No one knew what it was going to be. We talked about how it was a house, and then it was a store, and then it was a different kind of store. Um, and then they were able to brainstorm what could go into that building. We talked about sustainability with them and the importance of reusing the building versus putting it in a landfill. And also, you'll see we had a member of our Historic Preservation Commission actually talking with the youth. So getting other people involved is really important as well. Then when we get a little bit older, when we talked about empowering, um, so this is a youth advisory board that already exists. And I actually was struggling to get walkability signs put in our community. Council kept on deciding we weren't going to do that. And so I took it to the youth advisory board and council did not have any trouble saying yes to the youth advisory board. So it's another little tactic there. But also, this was they were able to go through and put together these walk your city signs, which aren't that expensive. It was a temporary installation, but they picked the locations and were able to install them. So they saw something that they worked on actually get implemented. And this is a QR code to go to our website if you have any questions about what we're working on, or if you need assistance getting your plan for youth engagement off the ground, we are happy to help. We are all volunteer board members, again, across the country. And we really, we do this because we love it. So I hope you reach out to us and let us know how we can help. And this is also our contact information uh, if you wanna reach out to us directly. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and jump into some Q&A real quick. We do have a lot of questions 
um, coming in, which is nice to see. Um, So the first question, I think we're going to start with uh, Della. Um, and yeah. the question says, to what degree does uh, a dynamic, uh, this dynamic where government outreach sometimes includes statements like, this is your chance to shape X, when in reality, the opinions will go into Appendix E of the document and decision makers have already uh, made the decisions. Uh, and then it says, to what degree are we required by AICP standards to understand and inform the community on the degree to which their feedback actually influences the project? So this is getting to your point about making sure that the expectations are set. Um, you know, just because it just because someone comes up with an idea doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, um, I haven't taught ethics in a long time, so I don't have the, I know we're all supposed to have the entire um, ethics guide completely and utterly memorized. I'm sure Christine does, um, but it's, if it's not fully in line, I mean, the, the, AICP code of ethics requires us to um, to be responsible to the community, to be looking out for the community's best interest, to be particularly mindful of those who have been um, not treated equitably in the past and in the present. Um, for those reasons, and I alluded to this, but I didn't state it explicitly because, again. Um, you know, I haven't I haven't memorized the uh, the AICP standards, but an ethical approach is almost always to be transparent. An ethical approach is almost always to tell the truth. Um, and so, in these contexts, I think I mean, do you want to say it's going to go in Appendix E? Probably not, because you don't know how many appendices there's going to be. And that could sound really flip, and, and that's not what we're trying to go for here. Um, the point isn't to demean what they're, they're bringing, what people are bringing forward. It's to be honest about it. And one of the other things that's important, I think, about behaving in an ethical manner in a political context, which we're working in a political context, is that if somebody doesn't agree with the direction that a decision is taking, elected and appointed officials are responsible to their community. So understanding who the appropriate person is to take those concerns to, um, it, that would be the most ethical thing to do. The non-ethical thing to do would be to go, oh, well, you know, it, that, that's a really, yeah, you know, we'll see what we can do with that. You know, if you can't do anything with it, then you can't do anything with it. And stringing them along is not, I would argue, ethical on either the generic level or in terms of the priorities set by the AICP Code of Ethics. Uh, Christine, you might be better, you might be more, somebody might be more up to speed on that. Um, does, does what I'm saying sort of jive with what you understand? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, again, it's to just, to, to be truthful and, and to be um, frank, but you know, in, in a way that doesn't discourage people from um, you know, participating in the future, right. for sure. It's not a too bad, so sad. It's just, okay, what you, it, it's honoring what the person or right. people have to say in that context right. and doing it in, in a realistic manner. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, related to that, I'm going to switch over to our Cincinnati crew here. And um, the question is, when you're having these in community engagement sessions, and I'm just going to pick on parking minimums, for example, 
do you set some kind of platform like basis to start the discussion you know we as planners can name 100 things about the pros and cons of parking minimums but your average community member doesn't have that knowledge so do you set some kind of framework to help them make the choices that you know that they're making in in terms of whether or not they want parking minimums like do you talk about it do you explain what they are and kind of go over some of the pros and cons of them without you know putting them in one direction or another oh Gabriel. no andrew you go ahead because you did the board <laughs> no so i mean in general our structure was so we started with the, the housing narrative then we did cincinnati and then um we would have a presentation that we would break it up into each of those activities. So um, for parking, we'd have a presentation about parking and one of our colleagues, um, Matt Lashide, he did a great um, graphic on SketchUp. So we showed like a uh, two um, neighborhood businesses. And then it was like, okay, one of them wants to put in a barber shop because the business wasn't there. And it's like, okay, to build the barber shop, you need, um, you're gonna need a certain amount of parking because of the parking minimums. And then we showed it like the building next door getting tore down and be like, see, like, this is what you need to do. Like, this is right, good, right? So we, we tried to show it very visually and tried to uh, make it some a way that would be understandable to people who are not like us and love all the, the nitty gritty details. <laughs> right. Um, but we did that for each of the, uh, each of the different policies to show. Like, I think we did about what, like five or 10 minutes of presentation. And then we do like 10 to 15 minutes of activity and then repeat that process over and over. Um, I'll stick with you for a second. How, um, how, how did you get folks to show up? What was your route um, to advertise these events and get people to attend? What was the carrot? I mean, I think we were actually kind of surprised at, at how much engagement we got. So we started in um, December doing that, this like pre-survey. It was actually sort of like to try and get a baseline of understanding of where people were at, where the interests were. And it was a more like a visual preference. So we, we asked some of the similar or some of the questions or like a lighter version of the, of the questions we engaged on. Um, and that was sent out through like, so we had a lot of city listserv support. So that was sent out through like the city's um, citywide listserv through our planning listserv, which has hundreds, if not thousands of people on that listserv. And that, and it was pushed out through like all the social media channels. Um, we also, um, I think we at, we reached out and asked for people to share like rec centers, um, you know, to share in their networks and whatnot, um, put it in our email signatures, um, had a whole web page for it. So um, yeah, I think that we honestly had, we were a little bit surprised at how much engagement we had, but it people maybe shared it by word of mouth and we had it in neighborhoods too. We did it in so many different, you know, locations. I think that also helped out. Um, Did you, I'll, I'll oh, also ahead. add to that, Maria. Um, it helped um, that this got put in the news a couple times as well. Um, in our registration, we did ask people how they had found out about the event to kind of help guide this in the future. Um, and a lot of people said the news as well. Great. Did you offer um, like bus vouchers or food or anything like that to encourage folks? That may not be able to drive or their the closest location is is too far for them to walk we yeah so we one of the things we looked at we didn't offer vouchers for the bus but we did try to make sure that it was either on a bus line or very close to a bus line um and then we also had the virtual option which we were hoping i know it's still it's like and we I think the data showed that we still missed a portion of the population that are affected by you know the policy changes um but yeah and then we did um our director actually got food every time. So she, you know, provided the snacks and and that was, I mean, people definitely appreciated that. I think it was from six to eight, that was the time frame we pretty much stuck with. Um, but yeah, I, I think something and something in the in the Bloomberg engagement process, just quickly to touch on was that we noticed like we were, we were, we were trying to answer the question, like how can we do better engagement? And what we found was like people want us to come to them and to their communities. And so I think something that we are looking into doing in future engagement because we are planning on engaging on once we've released policy recommendations, draft policy recommendations, we would like to engage on those as well. Um, but we are wanting to go into those communities that we that we tracked that really we didn't hear from and try and say, hey, like, what do you think of these? And what? how would you, can we get you in the future? 
Thank you. Um, okay, let's go. Yep. Let's talk. The first question is, it just made me laugh. So how do we explain to a five-year-old what urban planning is? To our, our, our youngest group, obviously, there are some terms or concepts that aren't appropriate for a five-year-old. Um, but where do we start and providing examples and things like that? Yeah, um, I have a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, what I talked about with the second graders is probably pretty similar. You don't want to try to tackle it all at once, um, although you might be surprised at how much they already understand. Uh, I think, you know, talking about what a plan is, what are your, I, you know, it's something about the future. Future is, you know, can be a hard concept in and of itself um, and having an idea for the future and making sure that you, you can tackle different pieces of it. You might not get to all of urban planning at once, but you can start planting the seeds, um, you know, doing things like how do we get from point, you know, here to there and things like adaptive reuse kids actually understand that a five-year-old can get that it's not this anymore and it's something new um friend i don't know if you want to yeah we also you know um we have a powerpoint presentation that you can download and mm -hmm. uh, modify to fit your needs um but it can start in kindergarten and so we talk about you know the world like urban planning is how the city is built how the world around you is built and so visually we do that and we say you know and this is transportation you know we go through all the different types of planning and we have a visual you know this is like if you've been on a like i always ask questions who's been on a bike path or who's been you know on the highway or who's you know, been on the, the light rail, you know, we try and um, get to their memory and their senses and where they've been and kind of put that together, piece it together. And then, of course, always with the tactile, I always bring these building blocks, you know, let's see who could build the tallest tower the fastest or, you know, working together, you know, planners work together on, you know, things that they do. Um, we don't think do this work by ourselves, you know, things that the concepts that they can understand um, and and be able to, you know, kind of explain that in a way uh, where they get it, you know, they understand maybe they've been by City Hall, you know, um, so there's ways that you could do that very easily. Um, and uh, we visually do that as well um, with the five year olds. And that's super helpful. I mean, I think it's like what you know, Cincinnati said, too, it's all about meeting people where they are. Um, another thing that's really fun is to bring your zoning code, like the physical version of it and talk about how the, these are the rules for your city. Um, <laughs> they totally get that because they understand rules for their classroom. So you know, things like that to really bring it to where they are. And we always say, I have to add this, if you can explain <laughs> planning to a five-year-old, you can explain planning to anybody. So this is like a skill <laughs> that is transferable for <laughs> all the work that you do, because you may have a 25-year-old who, you know, you have to explain it to or 55-year-old. But, you know, this is something that if you can get the basics down and really be articulate about what you say and say it in a meaningful way, um, you can really say it to anyone. Do you have um, examples of communities specifically like on your website that either have a program or have done, you know, like one off engagements with the local elementary school? Do you have examples of that on your website? We do. So we have um, kind of a running list of examples. So we've kind of looked nationwide at what other people are doing. Um, so we try and showcase that, sort of highlight, you know, the different planning processes and then also going in the classroom. So we're also very um, present on social media. And so we do post a lot of um, the, the items that people share with us going into the classroom, um, our experiences um, in the classroom and helping out with planning processes. So we have a lot of really great examples um, to show folks. Um, so we're always getting information in from those who are doing um, the work and then also people who want to volunteer. So if you want to do this as part of the work you do, or you want to go in as a planner and you have, you know, you want to have connections with your school district or your school or a teacher, um, we can help you do that um, in a very easy way. So uh, we always encourage people, you know, if you haven't incorporated youth, like do it now, like today's the day. Um, don't wait. Wonderful. I think we have time for for one one more question. Um, and this one, it was um, the Cincinnati group typed in a response, but I just want to ask it for folks that don't see it or didn't read it. Um, and this is also kind of a, a larger picture. You know, people participate in community um, events like this. They give their opinion, and then, well, where does it go? 
like what what happens next you know like the question for Della is oh well it's going in appendix e well what does that mean like I don't want it to go in appendix e I want to see something Whatever you know that something that I yeah. said or something that I believed actually happened so um for Cincinnati what kind of follow-up uh is there with the community particularly or at least planned when uh, some of these concepts are actually put into action. Is there a plan to then reach back out to the community that participated and say, okay, look here, this is what you said. And look, this is what we did. And it was because of you and what you said. So um, if you could talk just for a moment about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, we, I mean, we're planning an one a whole another round of engagement once we release the draft policies but yeah i think once we have we've been spending the last month month and a half to, to craft those policies carefully first we like synthesized all the data because we have a, a lot of qualitative and quantitative data so yeah i'd say we're going to be sending out the results um, whether it's a report or you know slideshow or or web page um, and then we are going to do you know, the next round of engagement where we're going to say, hey, this is what we heard and here's what we're proposing. I mean, I think that's that's sort of the plan. I don't know if, if Abby or Andrew, you guys want to add to that. I would just say um, we, we do plan to make all of this feedback that we've got from these events public eventually, like Maria said, um, through a report or a one pager to summarize. That way um, it's transparent that, you know, we're presenting what we've heard and acknowledging that we've taken that into account with our proposals. And we've hired one engagement specialist and we're hiring another. So it's uh, definitely something we're focused on long term. Great. Um, one more question. Um, what kind of budget was set for Cincinnati to do all of this community <laughs> engagement? Because I'm mentally hearing people saying, well, my community has a staff of me. And that's it. So <laughs> I can't do what you, you know, your group of 12 or 15 folks can do with a budget that the city of Cincinnati has. Um, I know you, Andrew just said that, you know, you have a consultant coming in, but was the majority of this done in house? Did you have volunteers? Was it part of a budget? Was it a grant? Like how, and I guess, you know, how, how can smaller communities that don't quite have the luxury that the city of Cincinnati had to, to do some of this? Yeah, we actually did everything in house. We um, we, so we hired, we got to approve for two position, new positions in the city, um, sort of like right towards the beginning of this process. So there were there was one community engagement specialist that's a position here, and then it was really just our internal team. And and I think um, some of our some of it was prioritization for us. I think we 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 did a lot. We sort of did a lot of extra work. This was sort of an addition to the regular workloads that we had. Um, some of some of us were new, so had a little bit more time on their plates. But um, yeah, I would say this is a it's, it was a fairly big undertaking, and it's sort of I mean it's sort of like a big experiment to see how like this is a new newer pro kind of process that we're trying to implement here, and to see how it works because I, I don't know that we've really been um, as involved in this way on the, such big topics because um, we did in in 2012. Um, really, Catherine, our director, led the Plan Cincinnati. Um, you know. The, the new master plan for the for the city and that was a three-year process that they did bring in they did a lot of it themselves and brought in other other you know consultants but yeah i would say and we we also tried it we were posting everything on the on the web page like the game is on there for people to play and customize okay. so I, I would say like if you're a smaller community definitely go to our website and take and take and modify what you can but um but yeah i would say it was it was a lot of time and sometimes we had more time and sometimes we had less but i will say that the sort of rapid prototype and testing was really, really helped to speed up the process and kind of cut down on some of that, like, you know, extra research and, oh, is this going to work or not? We just, we just did it. We tested it. And that I would say helped it come out a lot smoother and quicker. Great. I would just, as um, a, oh, go ahead. Yes, I was yes. just going to add to that, that um, we don't have a super large department. Um, we have six planners in our department um, and we still did this in-house. So, um, the barrier to entry might not be as large as people think it is. Um, it really, I feel like, just came down to having staff who's very passionate and excited about the work that we are doing and willing to dedicate a lot of time to it. Great. Um, 
a link to the city of Cincinnati's uh, materials is in the chat. And then also a link um, to the uh, YEP website. This link specifically goes to like the best practices. And some of those slides were up during the presentation, but obviously peruse the whole site there. Um, and don't forget to log your CM credits, everybody. We are recording this. We'll post it on our YouTube channel. So feel free to share with everybody. Um, and if you have any other follow-up questions, feel free to get them to me or directly to our panelists. If you get them to me, I'll get them out there. Don't forget to register for all of our upcoming sessions. You can get all the information at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So thanks to the YEP team. Thanks to the city of Cincinnati team and the Wise Economy team. We thank everybody for joining us today for this webinar and uh, have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Bye everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Bye.